The River Thames flows through London. Under Tower Bridge, past the Tower of London, beneath the cars and hurrying people on London Bridge, past wharves and warehouses with the Dome of St. Paul's in the background. And that is the landmark that we'll visit today. And you remember, we saw the Baltic Sun pass through Tower Bridge and into the Pool of London. We visited London's fortress, the Tower, and we saw Romans, Saxons, Tudors hurrying over R London Bridge. The Mayor and Aldermen in the Guild Hall. And then, further west, on high ground, stands the city's most important church, St. Paul's Cathedral. I walked up Ludgate Hill towards the west front, which is the main entrance. I thought the workmen had finished cleaning off the black soot and dirt, so I was surprised to see scaffolding up round the dome. They told me the workmen were renewing the lead covering. And I could, in fact, see the shaft of the lift that they used to get up there. I met one of the surveyors who look after St. Paul's. And he took me through the churchyard and in at a little doorway under the scaffolding. The foreman showed us to the first lift. And this took a full minute to reach the top of the main building. The people down below in the street seemed quite small. Then we walked round the first stage, a kind of platform, to the second lift. This carried us up past the drum which encircles the dome. I could almost touch the tall stone columns with their carved heads. From the second stage, there were wonderful views over London, east to Tower Bridge, southwest past the cathedral clock towers to Westminster, west to Ludgate Hill. Then Alan climbed still higher, up ladders between the scaffolding to watch the men working. First, the old lead was being stripped off from the wood underneath. It's taken away to the foundry, where new lead is added. And after it's recast, it's brought back to be used again. The new lead, already cut to shape, is unrolled and spread over the wooden frame. 
then pressed into position. The joining edges are carefully hammered down. Screws are fitted and then tightened. These are the screw heads in their sockets and now they've been soldered to protect them from rusting. All this work, remember, sometimes in difficult positions, is done high above the rooftops. If you watch now, you'll see some of the jobs being done. And the men doing them are called plumbers, because they work in lead, like those who mend water pipes. This man is stripping off the old lead. while his mate tightens the screws holding down the new. Finally, the edges are fastened down. The foreman gave me this piece of lead to show you. It's about a foot square and it weighs eight pounds. But heavier, you, uh, heavier lead is used in the grating and guttering and roofs where people walk. Although it's quite heavy, it's fairly soft as you'll see when I try to press it into shape. There we are. And I can press it right down if I use the correct tools. This tool, I expect you noticed the workman using it earlier, is called a dresser. It's a shaped piece of wood and it's been worn quite heavily down at the bottom here by hammer blows. As a souvenir, the foreman also gave me this piece of old lead. And if I turn it over to the other side, there, you can see one of the original nails which held the old lead to the wooden roof. Here's another of those nails. It's of hand-wrought iron, and although it isn't worn or rusted at all, the head has been hammered level by hammer blows. It's quite flat. These nails and this lead were used when St. Paul's was first built, 260 years ago. And the man who planned all this to last so well was Christopher Wren. He was surveyor to the king, and he designed many buildings about that time, particularly churches. I expect you remember that in 1666, when the Great Fire of London started down by the river, it spread very rapidly partly because the streets were so narrow, but also because many of the shops and houses were made mainly of wood. The old city was destroyed and St. Paul's was ruined. Christopher Wren designed a magnificent new building, very modern for those days. There'd never been such a dome in this country. He wanted to build in white Portland stone to rise above the London streets but this would have made the dome far too heavy. So he designed a stone drum. We saw the columns as the lift went up the scaffolding, remember? Next, he designed a stone base with square windows. Then the dome itself, lead over timber. Finally, a stone lantern or turret. So although the dome was lighter in weight, its grey-coloured lead matched up well with the stone above and below it. But Wren had to think of the people inside the cathedral as well, and this dome would seem too high and far away for them. So inside, he built up from the stone base an inner dome. Above this, and hidden from the church below, a brick 
cone. This would support the heavy stone lantern. And outside, the lead covering. So that when the building was finished in 1710, visitors could stand in the wide space under the dome and look upwards. They would see the painted figures, the square windows, and the light coming in from the lantern. When finished, the dome really did rise above the city, surrounded by the towers and steeples of churches, many of them designed by Wren. The whole cathedral looked magnificent, large and raised up. Its creamy white stone glowed in the sunlight. The Portland stone had been carefully carved to catch the light, and important parts of the building were given special decoration, like the pediment over the Great West Door, for instance, the phoenix above the south porch. The cherub's head, carved from the keystone which supports the window arch. The fruit and leaves, too, were carved before the stone was put in place. In the studio, we have such a piece of prepared stone. The carver uses these tools, and these haven't changed much since Wren's time. The punch, the claw, gouge, chisel, and quirk. Punch, claw, gouge, chisel, and quirk. These tools belong to Mr. Gardner, a stone carver. He's done repairs on St. Paul's and many other churches in the city too. Mr. Gardner, I suppose it's very important how you use your tools, how you hold them. It certainly is, because although the carver has complete control and holds the tool firmly, he has freedom of movement to use the tool as an artist would a brush or chisel. I see. It's quite flexible across the wrist, isn't it? When yes, yes. It. I wonder if you'd be kind enough to show us the job that each of these tools can do on the stone itself. That would be quite exciting for us. I think so. Thank you. I'm using, a, I'm using a chisel to chop out an elementary leaf. If I use a gouge, it can make the shape because it's a hollow. That's a rough form of probably a laurel leaf or something. another one at the back. And probably a stem to connect the leaves up. some berries as well. Hey, how's that? Well, that's 
marvellous for such a short period of time, Mr. Garner. Thank you very much indeed. It really is marvellous. Um, I wonder if you could tell us vaguely how long it would take to do a complete cherub's head, for instance. Oh, probably two weeks. About two weeks. Probably. Mm -hmm. I expect we could find out from Wren's old account books who carved the original cherub's head in St. Paul's Cathedral. We do know that Francis Bird carved the pediment with the figures of St. Paul above it. Here's St. Paul with a party of the Roman soldiers who were accompanying him, when a blinding light from heaven stopped them and frightened the horses. You can see the horses rearing up. At St. Paul, in the middle, his horse has fallen. The cathedral church of St. Paul's took 30 years to complete, and lots of artists and skilled craftsmen like stone workers, bricklayers, plumbers, metalsmiths, all worked very hard during that time to complete it. And you can see how well they worked because it's practically unchanged after 260 years. From the southeast, you realize how massive it is. For years, the stone was black with soot and grime and now it's as bright as it was in Wren's time. Queen Anne came to the first services. And you can imagine how on important occasions the Queen, Lord Mayor and City Alderman walked up the broad steps and in by the west door. just as they do today. Once inside, they proceed along the wide aisle towards the altar. This is London's cathedral, and many great men are buried here. The Duke of Wellington, Nelson, Sir Christopher Wren himself. So you see, there's a great deal more for you to find out about St. Paul's, Christopher Wren, and the City of London. <laughs>